Maybe the answers will never be where we think they are. Maybe we have to learn to find new places to search. You are such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on my Wicked Winter series. This is a new series I am doing for December where I'm posting 31 days of continuous content, meaning you will get a video every single day for me. So if you are not already and you would like to be notified when I upload every day, please make sure you are subscribed with the post notification bell on and prepare yourself for 31 days of Wicked Winter. But this case that we're doing today is so complicated that it took 40 years to be solved, but not without first untangling a web of murders that could possibly have been connected. When I tell you to listen closely, I mean it because otherwise you are not going to understand a single thing. Now let's get to the story. It began in 1955 on October 16th. It was a Sunday afternoon at around 3.15 or 3.30 when three boys headed from the northwest side of the city to downtown Chicago. They were 14-year-old Robert Peterson, 13-year-old John Schusler, and his brother, 11-year-old Anton Schusler. They had wanted to see a matinee movie at the Loop Theater, and their mother actually helped them pick out the film they were going to go see, because back then, it wasn't as common for parents to have to go everywhere with their kids. If they were dependable the first time, they were trusted to do it again, and so Robert's mother decided that she would help them pick out a movie that was age-appropriate for them, and then they would go. So once they decided on the Disney's film, The African Lion, they headed on their way. It was $4 for them to get into the movie altogether, and it was a normal preteen outing that had a lot of other teens there as well. Their parents actually had to go to the police station a few hours later because they hadn't come home. It was supposed to be a short, safe outing, but they never returned, and once the parents realized that, they went out searching for them. They first went to the Loop Theater, and when they didn't find them there, they searched every other theater nearby. And then as a last ditch effort, they decided to try a bowling alley because it was one of Robert's favorite things to do. But it seemed as though the boys had just vanished. When the police began their investigation, it was found that the boys had actually been spotted around 6 p.m. long after the movie would have ended at the Garland Building at 111 North Wabash. No one knew why the boys would have been at this building and the only connection they could find to the boys was that Robert's eye doctor was in the building, but it was a Sunday afternoon and not really the time for an optometrist's visit. They were in that building for about five minutes, and they were spotted next at 7.45 at the Monte Cristi Bowling Alley on West Montrose. It was also a neighborhood eating place, and the owner said that he had seen the boys there, and he'd also seen an odd-looking older man watching them as they bowled. He didn't know if the man ever made contact with the boys, but the boys did leave on their own and headed down Montrose to another bowling alley. And at around 9.05, they were spotted for the last time sticking their thumb out at an intersection of Lawrence and Milwaukee Avenue asking for a ride. Two days later, they were found at around 12.15 in a shallow ditch about 100 feet east of the Des Plaines River on the outskirts of Chicago. A salesman had spotted their bodies after he was going to eat lunch at the Robinson Wood Indians burial grounds and he called the police. Once the police got there, they realized that the boys' bodies were naked, bound, and mutilated and piled on top of each other. When the coroner, Walter McCarran, inspected the bodies, he found that Robert Peterson had been struck repeatedly and had been strangled by either a rope or a necktie. Their deaths were all ruled to be caused by asphyxiation, by suffocation, and they had all had adhesive tape over their eyes. They had been dead for 36 hours before they were found, or a day and a half. They were thought to be thrown from a vehicle, but their clothes were never found even after the search through the woods. Officers were going door to door interrogating, trying to figure out what had happened, but this sent the public into a panic. The officers even said that they had never seen a more horrible crime. They weren't finding any clues, including fingerprints, and the problem with this investigation was that so many different police departments were trying to work on this, meaning they were running into each other, but they weren't working together. And so it was thought that anything that was actually found in this case would have been lost in the confusion between the different departments. They all had the mutual agreement that this was probably done by a madman or a group 
or a gang of older youths. The Schusler brother's father was obviously devastated by this, but he said something that captured the, the horror that all of the other parents in the area were feeling. And he said, when you get to the point that children cannot go to the movies in the afternoon and get home safely, something is wrong with this country. Their funerals were at the Roman Catholic Church and 1,200 mourners were in attendance. And shortly after, only a month after the killings, Mr. Schusler, their father, died at 41 years old of a heart attack. And it's thought that it was possibly from the stress. But for the other members of the three boys' family, they felt as though their life had ended as well because there was nothing being found in this case. After months of nothing happening and no clues being found in this case, their bodies were exhumed once again to be looked into further, but no other clues were found there either. Then, a year after the murders, two Chicago sisters were found dead on the side of the road. Their names were Barbara and Patricia Grimes, and they were 15. And 12. They disappeared on December 28th of 1956 after leaving their McKinley Park home and heading to Brighton Park Movie Theater. They had gone to see Elvis Presley's new film called Love Me Tender for the 11th time. They were such big fans of him. So they left their home at about 7.30 p.m. that night and a school friend named Dorothy said that she had seen them at the movie theater at around 9.30 p.m. They were going to go see the movie for a second time because they loved him so much and so that would get them home at about 11.45 and their curfew was midnight. But they never made it home at all. They were reported missing at 2.15 in the morning of December 29th and the police went door to door once again, this time interrogating nearly 300,000 people. A few people even confessed, but later recanted it, saying they were coerced into it. Other teenagers at the movie theater were talked to who were there at the time, and they said that they saw the girls, and they also saw them talking to a man in a car that looked like Elvis Presley, and then they got in with him, and it was a Mercury model. On January 29th, they were still missing and had no answers, and this was such a big case that it reached Elvis Presley, who made an official statement saying, if you are good Presley fans, you'll go home and ease your mother's worries. He said this because there was a huge theory that they had just ran away from home, and if that was the case, Elvis wanted to help to bring them home. Three days later, a construction worker who was driving along a rural country road saw something behind a guardrail that looked like flesh-colored things and almost resembled mannequins. He went and got his wife so they could go together to look closer and see what it was, and they found that it was, in fact, the frozen bodies of the Grimes sisters were naked. Barbara was found on her left side and Patricia was found on her back covering her sister's head. It looked as though they had been drugged or thrown from a car and on Barbara there were three wounds that almost looked like they were from ice picks on her chest as well as blunt force trauma to her head and her face. Patricia's was about the same with numerous bruises on her face and all over her body. Their cause of death, however, was ruled as being a combination of shock and exposure because everything else was eliminated, but they could find that they had died five hours from when they had last been seen. The search around the crime scene and for their clothes was criticized once again because the same departments were trampling all over it and 160 officers were there but not working together and possibly losing evidence or just walking all over it or not sharing the correct evidence with different people and so it didn't go very far either. Their death certificates, however, did say that their cause of death was murder and there were a few suspects in the case that were looked into and one being Edward Bedwell. He was a 21-year-old drifter who had just lost his home that November and he had worked part-time as a dishwasher at this certain restaurant. Now, this owner came forward saying that on December 30th, the day after they were reported missing, she had seen Edward, another man, and two girls who resembled the Grimes sisters in their restaurant. Edward also resembled Elvis Presley. After three days of interrogation, he confessed 
to a 14-page confession that was written out, signing it on January 27th. He said he was with them from December 30th to January 7th, going to different bars on West Madison Street, and after January 7th, he and his companion fed them hot dogs, beat them to death, and then threw them in a ditch after they refused sexual advances. The Grimes sister's mother, however, her name is Loretta, she said that it was a lie because her daughters would never be on West Madison Street because they didn't know where it was. Edward's accomplice came forward. He was 28-year-old William Cole Willington, and he said that he was, in fact, with two girls on December 30th, like they'd said, but they were not the Grimes sisters, and he did not murder them. Then Edward recanted his confession altogether, and it was found that there was no hot dogs or alcohol in their system, like his story said, and they hadn't been beaten to death either. Edward was also found to have clocked in at his job at the Ajax Consolidated Company at 419 on December 28th and clocked out at 12:30 a.m. December 29th. So it would have been in the time frame where the girls would have been kidnapped and he was at work. So he was released. Then later that same year, he was tried and acquitted for the 1956 rape of a 13-year-old girl in Oak Hill, Florida. A 17-year-old was also suspected of being the murderer and his name was Max Flegg. He was brought in for questioning and they wanted to do a polygraph on him, but under the Illinois law, he physically could not be polygraphed. So the police captain decided to ask him if he would secretly do it. And oddly, he said he would. And so allegedly, when they did this test, he confessed to the murders. But since it was done in secret, nothing could be done about it and he was released. But he was later jailed for the murder of another young woman. Then a 53-year-old named Walter Cranes is looked into. He was a steam fitter and a self-proclaimed psychic. And he had actually called the switchboard operator a week before the Grimes sisters were found, saying that he knew they were dead and where the bodies would be found. Then a week later, they were found less than a mile away. He wanted to remain anonymous on the call, but they traced it back to him. And when he was brought in for questioning, after the girls were found a mile away, he said that he had ancestors that were psychics. He was a psychic himself, and after a night of heavy drinking, he had this vision come to him. The Grimes sister's mother, Loretta, also received a ransom note before the girls were found and his handwriting was thought to have matched the handwriting on the letter. But with no other evidence and him denying everything, he was released as well. Then in May, four months after the girls were found, Loretta got an anonymous call. This caller said, I know something about your little girl that no one else knows, not even the police. The smallest girl's toes were crossed at the feet. Then he laughed and hung up the phone. Loretta believed that it was someone that they knew that killed her daughters, but the police thought it was a sexual predator. Was it the same person that had murdered the three boys a year prior? Nobody knew. They had zero connection between the cases and neither of them were being solved. And it took 39 years for anything else to come forward in the boys' case, the Schusler and Peterson murders. 39 years in 1994, when a detective was looking into another murder case. It was another cold case of a 66-year-old candy heiress named Helen Marie Voorhees Brock, who had vanished and hadn't been seen again. She disappeared in 1977 and was thought to be a victim of the criminals involved in horse racketeering at the time, especially stable owners Silas Janes and Richard Bailey. She was never found but was declared legally dead after several years and was thought to have been murdered. When a detective was looking into this, he was looking through several different informants at the stables and anyone he could talk to. When, and he was interviewing a man named William Wimetti, who all of a sudden brought up the boy's murders and that he had heard a man boasting about killing them. This was completely a different case than what they were looking into, but that's when the detective knew that it was serious if he was bringing it up to him after all of these years. This man who had boasted about the killings was 22-year-old Kenneth Hansen, and he 
worked for millionaire Silas James, the one who is thought to be connected to the murder of Helen Brock. Now, Silas James wasn't just thought to be connected to Helen's murder, but also possibly to the Grimes sisters' murder and conspiracy to murder his half-brother in 1973. And now Kenneth, who worked for him, was thought to be involved in the Schusler peterson murders as well. Kenneth asked a neighbor right before he was arrested if the police were watching him and even packed a suitcase. But he was arrested in August of 1994 and the trial started in September of the next year. And they had quite the witness against him because a man named Roger Spree had worked for Kenneth Hansen who had worked for Silas Janes in the 1960s and he said that Kenneth had abused him ever since he started working for him at 11 years old. He said that a few years after the murders, Kenneth was drunk one day cleaning saddles and talking to him when he admitted something. He said, one time I picked up three kids. My thing was to have sex with two boys. That was my fantasy. He then said he brought them to a barn, sent Robert Peterson off to brush the other horses, and he started abusing the Schuster brothers. He said Robert Peterson returned in the middle of him doing this and so he began choking him for what he had seen and he said it was an accident that he didn't mean to kill him but after that he had no choice but to kill the other two boys. So he killed the other two boys. Kenneth's boss Silas Janes actually had an insurance claim that his stables had burnt down around this time, making people wonder if possibly he knew about this and set fire to his own barn to get rid of the evidence. Many other victims of Kenneth Hansen came forward saying that, that he promised them jobs in return for sexual favors. Some even said that he threatened them for speaking out about it, saying that they could end up like a Peterson boy. Prosecution believed that he had picked up the boys as they hitchhiked and he lived around the same area at the time where they would have hitchhiked and he brought them back to Idle Hour Stables where he tried to pay them for sexual favors and when they wouldn't do it, he killed them. Neighbors reported screams from the very stables that day but no officers went to check it at all. The defense attorney tried to say that it was the doing of serial killer John Wayne Gacy, had nothing to do with Kenneth, of course. And if you know anything about John Wayne Gacy, he is a very disturbing individual, but he would have only been 13 at the time. Not saying it's impossible, but to overcome three boys at that age would be a little hard to do. But in the case of Kenneth Hansen, there was really no evidence against him, and yet when the jury went to deliberate, it only took them an hour to find him guilty of the three boys' murder and sentenced to 200 to 300 years in prison. Five years later, his conviction was overturned by a judge saying that his history of pedophilia was brought up in the courtroom and swayed the jury's votes against him. And so there was a retrial, but it ended the exact same way. He was guilty once again. And Kenneth died two years later in 2007 of natural causes while still being in jail and saying he was innocent. Now at first I thought that this was some huge horse racketeering murder ring that was happening between not only Kenneth Hansen but Silas Janes and it was a huge cover-up type thing going on when I was reading about it with not only the boys but also the sisters and possibly the candy heiress. But then I found something else because now the boys murders have been solved were thought to have been solved, but the Grimes sisters' murders were still an unsolved case and they had happened around the same time as the boys, so it had been so many years now. And then a private investigator in 2013 re-looked into this case. His name was Raymond Johnson and he believed that a 23-year-old child killer named Charles Leroy Melquest had killed the Grimes sisters. He was an original suspect in their case, but was released and a year later was convicted of murdering a 15-year-old girl named Bonnie Lee Scott. He actually knew her personally and had decapitated and left her body. It was 10 miles from where the Grimes sisters had been found 
And once again, the police noticed the similarities in Bonnie's case and in the Grimes sisters, but they couldn't find a connection. And although Charles Leroy Melquest was suspected in their case, he was never questioned about it because his attorney forbade him to be. But the day after Bonnie's body was found, the Grimes sisters' mother, Loretta, got another anonymous call. And this time it said, I've committed another perfect crime. This is another one those cops won't solve and they're not going to put blame on Bedwell or Barry Cook. They were suspects in the Grimes case at one point and obviously very wrongfully suspected because they didn't do it or we don't know, I guess, so they aren't thought to have done it. Loretta was sure after that call that it was the same voice, the same caller that had called to tell her that he had killed her girls. And Loretta knew that this caller was serious because that first call about the girls where he knew the deformity on Patricia's foot was true and it had never been released to the public or the press. So nobody would have known about it unless they were really close to the girls. And if this was during winter, it's not like she would have been wearing sandals. She would have been wearing proper shoes that covered her feet. But what I want to ask you guys is, could all of these cases be connected? When I just kept researching more and more, the connection just the connections just kept showing up, but not enough to be sure about it, which is probably why the Grimes sisters case is still unsolved. Because we have Charles Leroy Melquest who was convicted of murdering Bonnie Lee Scott. And we have Kenneth Hansen who was convicted of murdering the Schusler Peterson boys. But then we have an unsolved case of the candy heiress Helen Brock who led them to Kenneth Hansen. And we have the Grimes sisters who has an eerily similar case to the Schusler peterson murders, but their mother also got a call after Bonnie's murder as well. So you can tell that it's just like a tangle of connections that don't really make sense and don't really have answers. There are two cases here that still haven't been solved. I mean, could this all be connected? Could this have been one massive serial killer that we all overlooked? Or was it just a random bunch of murders that are, have eerie similarities? I mean, you know, the boys, Bonnie and the sisters all are around the same ages, but the candy heiress is ob was obviously a little older. So it makes me wonder if this was a giant scheme in the horse bracketeering cover-up thing that was happening of murders and cover-up and, and criminal behavior. And what if someone got cocky or slipped up and killed this candy heiress who had a lot of money and could have the resources to eventually get this case reopened. And then when it was reopened, it split everything open again because it connected them all. But the more I think about it, it wouldn't really make sense for Kenneth Hansen to go after the Grimes sisters because he did have such an obsession with young boys. It almost makes me think that Charles Leroy Melquest was the one, he was convicted of murdering Bonnie and possibly he murdered the Grimes sisters as well which would connect them in the way that Loretta got anonymous calls for both of them. And then the boys' murders and the unsolved one of Helen Brock, the candy heiress, could have both been done by Kenneth Hansen and his employers, so Silas Jane and all of them. So they're all linked together as well, just not, not exactly in the fact that it was Kenneth Hansen's doing, maybe it was him and his employers all doing it together. I mean, I am so incredibly happy that the Schusler peterson boys and Bonnie Lee Scott got their justice. Their murderers were caught in the eyes of the system and they were put into jail. But it angers me for the Grimes sisters and Helen Brock who never got their cases solved. And there's, there's just so many, especially young kids in this, that were that lives were taken too soon. And yes, it's interesting for me to look into the webs and the conspiracies and all of this, but at the end of the day, these were lives that were taken far too soon. And so many of them, and there are still so many unanswered questions that I'm sure it eats their families alive. So please leave support for them down in the comments below because if any of them are watching, I know it's been so long, but you know, it's generation after generation and I hope that the pain isn't still there as much as it used to be. I hope at least their pain has eased a little bit. I just hope that especially the Grimes sisters, family, and Helen Brock never give up on finding justice for them. And I hope that this video brings a little bit of light to everybody's stories that I talked about. I didn't want to just make this about 
one set of murders. I wanted it to be all of them that connected them because I've never seen a video on YouTube about the Schusler brothers. I have seen some about the Grimes sisters, but there's so much more that goes into it. But I want you guys to let me know down below. Do you believe that any of them are connected? Do you think that my theories made any sense to you? Do you think that Charles Leroy Melquest was the one who murdered both Bonnie Lee Scott and the Grimes sisters? It's what makes the most sense to me, but it could also have been just some theory that we all have no idea about. And I love, that's why I love to hear your guys' down below, always being respectful to the victims and the victims' families, but I, I love to hear them because it's, it's a new perspective on a case that hasn't been talked about in years. So yeah, I know this was a confusing one and I really tried my best to make this as easy to follow as possible, but there's so much going on and so much that doesn't have a full connection. So it's not like it's just one smooth case, but that's what unsolved cases are anyway, because you're just trying to pull together any information you can find. But remember to come back tomorrow if you were excited about Wicked Winter and want another video because there will be another video for you guys. I'm so excited to be doing this for you guys, to give you back videos for all your support you always give me. And the fact that you guys make me feel like I'm not crazy by leaving your comments and your thumbs up and engaging with me because these are weird topics to talk about. They're dark topics and I love your support knowing that you care enough about these victims and how I tell the stories to you. So yeah. I'll let you guys go. Don't ever be afraid to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough and I love you to absolute pieces. Okay, bye. There's new information everywhere. We just have to know where to apply it so it matters.